everybody, my name is Kathleen Graham Kelly, and I'm your International School Coordinator. And look at this room. And I think our last bus just arrived, so in just a few minutes we'll be beginning. So I'll say to the band, our volunteer entertainers for tonight, they'd like to play one more song, and then I'm going to ask for the groups to introduce themselves. I'll call your name and have you cheer. And by then I can think we'll have Dr. Burr on the room. So you guys get one more song. Thank you. And ZZ John, Tori is the founder of Roots and Shoots Shanghai. Good evening. Thank you all for coming tonight for a uh, conversation with Jane Goodall. I'm Tori Swissler, the chairman of the board of Shanghai Roots and Shoots, and this is ZZ John, our executive director. Welcome. I thought you'd like to put some faces to the names, um, and, uh, and we are here to say we're really honored to be spending the Hallows Eve with you guys tonight. There are 21 schools here representing the international school community, and we welcome you, and we'd like to start the evening off with a um, short video, and it's about the Million Tree Project. The Million Tree Project that most of you guys have contributed to in a very significant way. And thank you very much, and enjoy the video. <laughs> Years ago, we had so many questions. How do you fight a problem that's so much bigger than you? How do you make a dream a reality? Sitting in a band with Dr. Jane Goodall in 2006, we tried to think of ways that we could improve the environment. We thought about trees and their positive effect on the earth. We thought about how trees replenish oxygen, sequester carbon dioxide, and prevent erosion. We dreamed of planting many trees. The Million Tree Project was born out of these thoughts. We would plant trees to stop desertification. We would plant trees and fight climate change. We would plant trees and help villages reclaim land that had been lost to China's growing deserts. Then we set ourselves an impossible goal, a preposterous goal to plant one million trees. We started small with only 8,000 trees and slowly increased that number each year as more and more donors got involved. We pulled a great team together that has now spent years carefully measuring, auditing, and sampling the plots to ensure that the trees are kept alive and well cared for. Our MTP team has steadily increased to manage and support this year-round work of tree planting, planning, teaching, pruning, auditing, and monitoring. But we didn't do it alone. Over the years, more than 800 students and company volunteers have traveled to this region with Roots and Shoots to help the local farmers plant trees and learn about the consequences of our daily actions. I, I think the Roots and Shoots program is amazing. And it's just, it's so neat to see so many people from all over working together. And their small communities are making our big community a better place. We've had more than 50 companies purchase forests of 2,000 trees and more. All of you helped fight back the desert with us. Dr. Robin Rose from Oregon State University has been helping us since 2008. 
His lifelong commitment to forestry has provided technical insights and allowed us to improve our survival rates and planting expertise. Rory 教授对我们项目来说是一个非常重要的一个人物。他不仅是给我们先期的时候做了很多的评估，也在现在再次来到库伦奇给我们一些技术的指导。We even have two of our team members living in Kulun to stay close to the trees and the local townspeople. I feel there are two things I feel very good about. One is a certain day in March, a certain day I come here, this place, I can see from a high point at the top of the mountain, I can see suddenly, ah, without any doubt, this tree has grown so big. Then I can see that the forest is green and green. It's very 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 green. We pruned, we watered, we improved our planting techniques. We even improved the nursery sites and worked closely with the local government and farmers. The Million Tree Project was launched in 2007. Students got involved. The local residents in Kulun got involved. The people of Shanghai responded in numbers we couldn't have imagined. People from around the world heard about the Million Tree Project and everyone bought trees. 918 hectares of land surrounding the town of Kulunchi has now been planted with trees. The soil is slowly becoming viable again, and the farmers are growing crops on the land between the trees. Together, we made it happen. One million trees are now grown in the desert of Inner Mongolia. It was our dream, and now it's a reality. But this is only the beginning. So now we can begin. Isn't that a fabulous beginning? And it's because of the vision of Dr. Jane Goodall, it's because of the vision of Tori Swizzler and the leadership of Zizi Jong that Indeed, together, you, we have planted a million trees and are now beginning on our second million. Okay. <laughs> thank you for getting here, um, and thank you for getting here on time. We know it was a big challenge. As we begin tonight, I'd like to talk about why we are we coming together. That's on already. Great. So, here's a very brief agenda. You've already been welcomed, you've already seen this fabulous video, and you're only the second group to see this video. So this is now a video that's a tool, and it shows you the power of story, the power of video. And I hope when you go back to your Roots and Shoots clubs, wherever you are, that you'll remember that sometimes a picture, indeed, will tell a story much better than a lot of words. So we're here together, we are um, going to hear um, an address from Dr. Goodall. You will have a brief opportunity to ask questions. Then we're going to have a very exciting time where awards will be granted, and I'll tell you about that in a few minutes. And then we'll follow with the launch of our learning guide. But first I'd like to thank you all for coming out on what for some people is a very holy day or a holiday, and that is Halloween. Um, we thought about asking you to come in costume tonight. And, and we thought, oh, that could be interesting. We could have them be in animal costumes or in nature costumes, or we ask everyone to wear green costumes. But then we decided that this night is very precious and that it might distract from the importance of what we're doing here together. So why have we come together? Um, the goals. Am I doing this myself? Right. So our teachers, our educators, our representatives from different organizations have come together, one, to honor Dr. Goodall, to thank her, and to hear her words of wisdom. We've also come together to celebrate, wow, a million trees. It's just unbelievable. Um, it's, when you think about it, a million. It's amazing. Um, we're also here to help you and us get energized because while a million trees have been planted and many other projects have been um, very successful, there's much to do. Um, we realize that each action we take makes a difference and so we're here to celebrate that 
and then really to be energized by the people around us, to be empowered, to go back and continue the work. Because every time we do something, we discover 10 more things to do. So that's why we're here tonight. And now I think that's the end. Oop. You see what's coming. But first, I have a very special honor, and that is I'm pleased to introduce the person we've all come to hear tonight. Our keynote speaker is indeed um, a world-known speaker, but she's more than that to us. You probably know something about Jane Goodall. Um, she is the creator of Roots and Shoots. I suspect you know that, that she started Roots and Shoots as her own global initiatives, but it didn't start as a global idea. It started in one community and has now grown around the world. Maybe some of you of my age, the teachers and parents in the room, grew up watching Dr. Goodall on National Geographic specials. Anybody here watch those? Anybody? Oh, look at Dr. Goodall. Look around the room. Look at that. We all grew up watching you. So we grew up together. Um, some of you might have watched her on Discovery Channel. And some of you, I hope a lot of you have already seen the film Chimpanzees, her current work that she advised on and is on it at the end of Done by Disney. Um, maybe you know, maybe you don't, that Dr. Goodall is a UN ambassador of peace. And she's been honored by the UN for her scientific and environmental contributions. Well, Dr. Goodall has also been honored by the Queen of England when she received the Dame of the British Empire. Those, that's what those initials mean, DBE. I didn't know what they meant until I had to look it up. So you know, you already heard, I guess, that she started Woods and Shoots in Tanzania in 1991. And that now she travels 300 days a year. I heard her say today there is no such thing as jet lag. I guess if you travel 300 days a year, it, you are wherever you are and it doesn't really matter. Maybe you know, maybe you don't, but this is the 11th time Dr. Goodall has been here in China. I heard her speak five years ago in New York City. It was a huge gathering, thousands of people, something called the Celebration of Teaching and Learning. In the midst of those thousands, I thought, you know, someday I'd like to do that work. I was at that time working in education, and I thought, well, maybe I could do it. Fast forward, you know how life goes around here. I ended up in Shanghai. I was looking for a job, and guess what? I saw an advertisement for Roots and Shoots. Now, the, what inspired me when I heard Dr. Goodall was about her reason for hope, and you are my reason for hope. And that is that I see our youth our university students, our high school students, our middle school students, as the ones who hold the future of our world. That day, back in New York City, I said, someday that would be a good way for me to use my time. And here I am. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with you, and together we're going to hear Dr. Goodall's inspiration. So it's my honor to invite Dr. Goodall to the stage. Where chimpanzees still roam in the wild, you can also hear it in a zoo. 
although it has a slightly different meaning now, I think. But hello. <laughs> oh, that's what that means. Um, <clears throat> you just heard, you know, what I've done, who I am. But I want to start off with telling you a story, a fable actually. Maybe some of you know it. But it was a fable that my mother used to read to me when I was a child. And it was about how all the birds came together to have a competition. Because they were arguing who could fly the highest. And the mighty eagle is sure that he will win. And with these great, strong wings, he goes higher and higher. And gradually the other birds get tired. And in the end, they all drift back towards the ground. And the eagle is left high up above them. Hiding in the feathers on his back is a little tiny Jenny Wren, a very small bird. And now, when he's gone as high as he can go, she flies up, and she flies highest of all. And the reason I love this story is because, for me, it's very much a symbolic story. And if we think of our life as like an effort to always fly just a little bit higher, and reach a goal that's just a little bit above our grasp, how high can any of us go without our ego? And I look back over my life, and I think of the amazing people who helped me on my journey. And in a way, they're like the feathers on my ego. And there are big feathers, strong feathers, and small feathers, but every single feather playing its part in helping me to get to where I am today. Everywhere I go around the world, there are friends, and of course now, Everywhere I go, there seem to be Roots and Shoots uh, members. And there are the James Rivers Institute staff, and many of them here tonight, like Tori and Zizi and Megan and Tatiana. And also there's uh, from JGI in Beijing, there's <coughs> there are two people from Be 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 JGI in Beijing. But the the real influence on my life was my family. I think that's probably true for all of us as we grow up. And I had a very wonderful family. I don't suppose that we can choose the family into which we're born. I, it seems unlikely. But I was, I was born into a family and I had a very remarkable mother. And I, I attribute a lot of what I've done and a lot of who I am to the wise way she raised me. It turns out, from what I've heard, that even as a very small child, I loved animals. And when I say animals, I mean, you know, dogs and cats and birds and, and worms and everything that's out there <clears throat> that I had the opportunity to see. We lived in London, so there weren't that many animals to see. But this wise mother of mine, I was one and a half years old, and I do not remember this story, but she came up to my room she found I'd taken a whole handful of earthworms to bed with me. And instead of saying, ugh, throw those dirty things out, she said, Jane, if you leave them here, they'll die, they need the earth. And so together, we carried them back into the garden. And then when I was about five years old, I had this wonderful experience, this magical experience, of going to a farm in the country for a holiday. And for a little animal-loving girl who lived in the city, to be face to face with cows and pigs and horses was really exciting. I remember it so well. And I was given a job to help collect the hen's eggs. And in those days, there were no cruel battery farms where hens are cramped into tiny cages where they can't move or spread their wings. In those days, the hens pecked around in the farmyards. And they laid their eggs, for most of the time anyway, in these little wooden hen houses about so high with nest boxes around the edge. So the hen would climb up into the nest box and she'd go into the nests around the edge and I would come along and lift up the lid from the outside and put any egg that was there into my basket. So you all know what an egg looks like. You've all seen an egg, it's so big. So apparently, and I don't remember this, I began asking everybody, where does the egg come out of the hen? 
because I couldn't see a hole big enough. <laughs> and nobody gave me the answer I wanted. So I distinctly remember, remember, I'm five years old, I distinctly remember seeing a hen going up into her hen house and thinking, ah, she's going to lay an egg, crawling after her, big mistake. How frightening was that for the hen? Squawks of fear, she flew out. So I remember thinking in my five-year-old mind that this was now a dangerous place for the hens. And so I left it and I went into an empty hen house and waited. And I waited. And I waited. And I waited. Which was fine, except my family had no idea where I was. <laughs> it was apparently getting dark and my mother was still out desperately calling. And she sees this excited little girl rushing towards the house covered in straw. And it would have been so easy for her to get angry. How dare you go off without telling us? Don't you know how worried we'd be? Don't you ever dare do that again? Which would have killed the excitement. But she saw my shining eyes and she sat down to hear the wonderful story of how I had raised an egg. So I can see it to this day. Then she helped me find the books that she felt would make me read most quickly. Books about animals, because that's what I love. And so she continued to support me, and I began to read more and more books about animals. And I spent hours up in the beech tree in our garden with the books that I'd found reading them. And when I was about 10 and a half years old, maybe 11, I was in a second-hand bookshop because we didn't have any money, really, and uh, it was all we could afford, second-hand bookshops. And I found a little book called Tarzan of the Apes. And I bought it. I had just enough money to buy it. And I took it home. I went up my beech tree and I read it from cover to cover. And the next day I read it again. And of course it was about Tarzan. And of course Tarzan was this glorious lord of the jungle. And of course I fell madly in love with him. <laughs> and what did he do? He married the wrong Jane, didn't he? <laughs> so, of course I knew it wasn't a Tarzan, but nevertheless, that was what made me dream of going to Africa. I would grow up, I would go to Africa, I would live with animals, I would write books about that. That was the dream. Everybody laughed at me, how would I do that? We didn't have any money. Africa was very far away. It was the dark continent, dark with mystery. World War II was raging. And the worst of all, I was the wrong sex. I was just a girl. And back then, we're now going back uh, 70 years. Back then, girls didn't have opportunities to go off and do adventurous things like they do today. Back then, only the boys could do that. So no wonder people laughed at me and said, Jane, dream about something you can achieve. Except for my mother. And she said, if you really want something and you work hard and you never give up, you will find a way. So that was what I heard throughout my childhood. I don't remember hearing in my family that it was going to be tough for a girl. They just encouraged me to follow my dream. And every one of you here, maybe you have a dream. Maybe people laugh at you. But don't let them laugh you out of your dream. If you really want something and you really work hard, you never give up. You will find a way. That was the wonderful gift my mother gave to me. <clears throat> when I left school, I couldn't afford university. We didn't have enough money. You couldn't get a scholarship back then unless you were good in a foreign language. And uh, I never was. So when I left school, it was my mother, again, this wise woman. She said, well, do a secretarial course. We can just about afford that. And then maybe you get a job in Africa. So I did the secretarial course, it was very boring, but I did it. And I was lucky, I got a job in London, which was nothing to do with boring secretarial work, it was with documentary films. I learned all about how you make films, which has stood me in really good stead in my life. But then, <coughs> loving this job, loving being in London, having fun, you know, I was young and, and um, I was having fun. Then I got a letter from a school friend whose parents had bought a farm in Kenya and the letter invited me for a holiday. Yes, opportunity, right? So 
but no money. You couldn't save up in London and a job didn't pay much after the war. You just, you know, you were lucky to get a job you loved. It, you didn't really care about the money back then. So I went home and I worked in a hotel and I served people's breakfast, lunch and dinner. And it was not one of these fancy hotels where you drop in for lunch or you drop in for dinner. This was a place where people came for one week's holiday by the seaside. They didn't have much money after the war. So in order to get a reasonable tip, I had to work really hard for a whole week. But of course, I made sure they all knew I was there because I was saving up to go to Africa. So I'm sure I got a bigger tip from these people than I otherwise would have. Anyhow, finally, I have enough money saved up, wages and tips, for a return fare to Africa. Now, today, the young women of 23, it's common to go off to another country. That's what happens. But back then, going back 60 years, it wasn't normal at all. And many people criticized my mother and said, how can you let your daughter go off in this way? to what might be an unsafe place. But fortunately, my mother didn't listen to them. And her own mother was pretty remarkable too, my grandmother. So there I was, 23 years old, waving goodbye to my family, my friends, and my country, and setting off on this amazing adventure. And you know something? I look on life now where every day is an adventure, because you never know what you're going to learn who you'll meet, what's going to happen. But even though I think that way and try to think that way every day, there's nothing that can compare with that first time standing on the deck of this ship because that was the cheapest way to travel and the anchor is pulled up and I'm waving goodbye and setting off into the unknown and arriving in Kenya and staying with my friends having a job in Nairobi because the capital of Kenya because you didn't overstay your welcome. And hearing about Louis Fiki, somebody said, Jay, if you're interested in animals, you should meet Louis. And so I went to the Natural History Museum where he was curator. And he took me around and he asked me all sorts of questions about the animals and the plants, about the fish and the insects. And I think he was really amazed at a young girl straight from England with no degree, no college, knew so much. So he gave me a job. So what was that first job? His secretary, my wise and wonderful mother. She prepared me for this first breakthrough. And that being his secretary led to an extraordinary experience. He took me with his wife and one other young English girl to a place that's now very famous for anybody who knows anything about Queen history. It's a place where many of our Stone Age ancestors have been uncovered by paleontologists. But back then, no human remains have been found, only fossils of various uh, uh, ancient animals. And so there was no road, there was no trail. Today there's a road. Today there are buildings, a little kind of museum. Back then there was nothing. It was wild, untouched effort. And for the three months that we were there, at the most we saw was a, about four Maasai Moran walking through. Otherwise it was just the wilderness, the African plains, all the by gorge, Serengeti. And in the evening, this one young English girl and I were allowed to walk out onto the plains. And in those days, all the animals were there. So after working all day under the hot African sun, digging away, looking for the fossilized remains of, of uh, prehistoric creatures, now we're out with the living animals. And they were all there back then. There were the giraffes and the antelopes and the, and the warthogs. And, and one evening there was a rhino. And luckily, the wind was blowing from him to us. He knew there was something, but they don't see very well. So he trotted back and forth, and luckily went away in the opposite direction. And then one evening, there was a young male lion, full size, mane beginning to grow on his shoulders. He'd never seen anything like Julian and me before. He followed us, 
twice the length of this room, which was a little bit scary, but it was very exciting. And I think it was that day that Lewis decided I was the person he'd been looking for to go and study not just any animal. I would have studied any animal. It was the one most like us. And looking back over these now 54 years of this study, the longest unbroken study of any wild animal in the world, looking back, what is most, I think, remarkable, for another thing, uh, every individual has his own or her own personality. They're as different from each other as we are. For another thing, when they communicate non-verbally, they use the same postures and gestures as we do, and they're basically in the same context. Kissing, embracing, patting one another on the back when friends greet, swaggering and shaking the fist when males meet and have to reassert their dom relative dominant status. Uh, it was a very exciting day when I learned that chimpanzees can use to, and even make tools. When I first got to Gongri, the chimpanzees would take one look at me and run away because they're very conservative and uh, they'd never seen a white ape before. That's <laughs> <laughs> what I was. So, I was getting really worried. We had money for only six months. And I knew that if I didn't see something exciting in that first six months, that would be the end, the end of the study. I would have let the mistake down. <coughs> so, it was a very exciting day when this one chimpanzee, the first one to lose his fear, whom I had named David Greybeard, I saw him as I was walking along a trail, crouched over a termite mound, I saw a black hand reach out, pick off a piece of grass stem, use it as a tool, pushing it down into the termite mound, waiting for a moment, pulling it slowly out, biting off the insects that were gripping with their, with their jaws. And then I saw something even more exciting. I saw him pick a leafy twig and carefully pick the leaves off. He was making a tool. This doesn't sound exciting today, but back then it was very exciting because it was thought that humans and only humans used and made tools. And when I sent a telegram to Louis Leakey, you know, I wonder how many people in this room even know what a telegram is. <laughs> because we have email now. We didn't even have uh, fax or telex back then. We used telegrams. And I sent a telegram to Louis Leakey because I knew how excited he would be. And uh, he sent a telegram back. And he said, well, now we have to redefine man, redefine tool, or accept chimpanzees as humans. Mm -hmm. Because we were defined back then as man, the tool maker. So that was a very exciting discovery for the scientific world, although many scientists didn't believe it because I didn't have a degree. And why should they believe this? This was a crazy young English woman who was kind of living out there with the chimps. But anyway, it was also exciting because the National Geographic Society saw the photographs, realized that this was something special, and gave money so that I could continue when the first six months money ran out. And so I went on with the study and began to realize what to me has been really exciting and fascinating, how the chimpanzee childhood is long, because like us, they have to learn. They're not born with a whole set of instincts like insects. The young chimpanzee, like the young human, learns by observing, by imitating, and by practicing. And so, they have a very long childhood, just like our, our species does. And for five whole years, the chimpanzee child rides the mother's back, suckles from her, and sleeps with her at night, until the next baby is born. So there's a five-year spacing between live births. Chimpanzees, unlike us, don't overpopulate their forest world. There's a fairly high infant mortality, and quite a lot of females uh, never had more than two living offspring. So, all through the years I've been at Gombe, these 54 years, 
there has been absolutely no indication that chimpanzees overpopulate their environment. But watching the development of the relationship between mothers and their offspring, between brothers and sisters, has been absolutely fascinating. And these relationships persist through a life which, in the wild, is about 50 years. In captivity, they can live to be much older. The oldest one that we know is 75 years old. She could be a little bit older. She cannot be younger because then we know the day that she would, she arrived in the United States uh, as an infant whose mother had been shot in the wild. So <clears throat> over these years at Gombe, I think the saddest part, the most shocking part for me was finding that in certain situations, chimpanzees show a dark side to their nature, just like we do. They can be violent and brutal. We are still learning about which there is so much still to learn. So isn't it tragic that because of our human impact on the planet, this animal kingdom all the time is shrinking, other than human animal, I should say, because we're animals too. And it was when I realized in 1986 at a big conference in America with people who were studying chimps in different parts of Africa, it was when I realized at that conference how right across Africa, through the chimps range, forests were disappearing, chimpanzees were being hunted, hunted for food, hunted for the live animal trade, hunted so that mothers could be shot and babies shipped off to zoos or circuses or medical research. And at that same conference, I realized that, that in some captive situations, chimpanzees were horribly suffering in the medical research labs, five foot by five foot prison cells, where they had no comforts, they were on their own. These are very social animals, and they were suffering from, as, as a human being, in solitary confinement because they're so like us that they can catch or be infected with our diseases which other animals can't catch. And so I went to that conference in 1986 as a scientist. By then I had my PhD. I left as an activist. And since that day I haven't been more than three weeks in any one place. And I first began traveling around Africa talking to whoever I could, NGOs and uh, people in governments talking about what was going on, taking a little exhibition with me. It was sort of one man, very primitive exhibition, which was photographs, and I had tools used by chimpanzees in different parts of Africa because they use different tools, and that tool use is passed from one generation to the next through observation and learning, and it's a culture. And so I was traveling around Africa talking about the plight of chimpanzees, but I was learning about the plight of all the other animals. And I was learning about the plight of the, so many of the Africans living in abject poverty, with terrible disease, with ethnic violence, and realizing that an awful lot of their problems were the, the, the remnants of the old colonialist era, of which my country, Britain, was so responsible and realizing too that many of the uh, big international corporations today sweep into Africa and they want to take the resources of Africa. It's rich in minerals, it's rich in timber and all kinds of things. And they can also grow their crops and, and, and reap them and harvest them and send them back to their own countries, leaving the Africans always poorer. And so I thought, well, I better start traveling in Europe and in North America and then in Asia and now in Latin America as well and the Middle East and as I was traveling around all these countries learning what you all know I think about what we're doing to harm this planet you know about the deforestation leading to desertification you know about the shrinking fresh water supplies you know how the air the land and the water is being contaminated by the chemical pesticides and fertilizers and herbicides that we, we spray onto the land to grow more and ever more food in a more and ever more harmful way. 
You probably know how this is leaching down this poison into the rivers, into the lakes, and into the sea, and how the sea is becoming so acidified that it's no longer acting to absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. I'm sure you know how carbon dioxide goes up into the atmosphere as a greenhouse gas, and the greenhouse gas is supposedly what's leading to global warming, and I believe it is. And there are other gases contributing to these greenhouse gases too. We tend to eat more and ever more meat. And what is that doing to the environment? Rainforests are cut down to graze cattle, to provide grazing, or to grow grain, to feed cattle and pigs and, sh and chickens and so forth. For us to eat more and more and more meat, and for us to eat more and more and more meat, these animals are being put in these intensive farms where sentient beings, beings that have feelings and emotions, just like we do, are confined in the most horrendous conditions. And it gets worse than that. To keep them alive in those conditions, we feed them antibiotics, just as a regular part of their diet. So what happens? The bacteria are building up resistance. People have already died from a simple scratch on the finger because there was no antibiotic strong enough to cure that person. And it gets worse than that. These animals are fed unnatural food to make them grow quicker. And this creates uh, an excess of methane gas. Or what do I want to say? They poop. <laughs> and this gas goes up. And methane is a seven or eight times more powerful, more, more, more terrible uh, greenhouse gas than CO2. So look what we're doing to the planet. I've talked a lot about uh, similarities between us and chimpanzees, but there are differences, aren't there? And I believe the greatest difference is the explosive development of our internet. Chimpanzees are much smarter than we ever used to think. We know from captive experiments how they can use computers and how they can learn American sign language. I know from the wild how manipulative they can be socially and how clever they can be at solving problems with tools. But however bright a chimpanzee is, compare that with the extraordinary brain that has put a robot on Mars that's crawling around up there taking photographs that come back to Earth. Isn't that amazing? Think about it. That's what we've done. And so, you know, the big difference is this explosive development of the human intellect. So here's the question. The question is, how come the most intellectual creature to ever walk on planet Earth is destroying planet Earth? It's our only home. We know from the pictures that come back from Mars, we don't want to go and live there. We know from the pictures that came back from the moon, we don't want to live there either. We've got one home, and we're destroying it. And we're destroying it fast. So it's not surprising that as I was traveling around the world, talking to all these different countries about all these problems, I was meeting young people. And when they feel hopeless, they feel there's nothing they can do to change things, to try and to slow down this, this, uh, this race towards the extinction of life as we know it. And so, because I care passionately about the environment, because I care, care passionately about the wildlife living there, but because I also care passionately about the young people. This program, Roots and Shoots, was born, and it was actually born in Tanzania 21 years ago. It is, it, we've come of age this year. It began small with nine high schools, uh, sorry, 11, 12, if it right, 12 high school students. And they were on my veranda, they came from nine different schools. And they were, they were angry. They came because I'd been giving talks in the different schools. And some of them wanted to come and talk further. So they came on this Sunday morning. And they told me they were angry about the fact that the government wasn't properly punishing the poachers who were going into the national parks 
in shaping their elephants and their lives. They were angry because the government wasn't taking action against the dynamite fishermen who were dynamiting the coral reef, destroying coral reef, destroying the breeding grounds of the fish so that they could pick up the dead dynamited fish from the surface. And they were angry because in their schools at that time, in 1991, there was no environmental education in Tanzania. And they wanted me to do something about all of this. And I said, well, you know, I can't, but maybe you can. That's how Roots and Toots began, with these 12 students going back to their schools, gathering up their friends, and we had meetings, and we talked about what they could do. And because the chimpanzee was kind of what took me to that place, realizing the chimpanzees were vanishing, the chimpanzee, you can see, is sitting in the middle of a world where there are humans, and we still think of all the other animals as separate, and the chimpanzee is reaching out in both directions and saying, hey, to us, you know, we're part of your world, you're part of ours. And on the other hand, the chimps are reaching out to all the other animals and looking back at us and saying, they're part of your world too. And then there's the environment that we all share. So right from the beginning, the roots and shoots, I call it a movement now, it's a movement. It was encouraging young people to get together, to talk about their problems, the problems they cared about, to discuss, to think of ways they could solve the problems. That's how it all began, youth empowerment, letting young people talk about the problems, learn about the problems, and come up with their own solutions. So it, it did begin with these 12 high school students, and it's now in 131 countries. There's members from preschool all the way through university. And it's my greatest reason for hope. Because everywhere I go around the world, there are young people with shining eyes wanting to tell me what they're doing, what they've been doing, what they plan to do to make the world a better place. And it's very inspiring for me. It gives me a feeling that, yes, there is hope for the future. Young people, when they know the problems and they're empowered to act, they show tremendous enthusiasm and energy and sometimes true courage in taking action to put those problems right. But I have other reasons for hope, too. And one of them is the human brain. We've talked about the human brain, and I asked the question, how is it that the most intellectual creature on this planet ever is destroying the planet, its only own? And I think it's because we've lost something that I call wisdom. The wisdom where the indigenous people would sit around and come to a decision only after they asked the question, how will this decision we make today affect our people generations ahead? And today, <coughs> so often, uh, ask, uh, make decisions based on how will it help me now? How will it help the next shareholders meeting three months ahead? The bottom line, how will it help my next political campaign or my next job opportunity? Those are the questions. So it seems to me that there's been a disconnect, a tragic disconnect between this amazing brain that's put a robot on Mars and the human heart, which is the seat of love and compassion. And all around the world, people care about their children and their grandchildren. So there seems to be this, this disconnect where the brain is thinking one thing and the human heart is left out of it. And we have to reconnect the brain with the heart to achieve our true human potential. That's what I truly believe. And that if we can achieve our true human potential, then everything is possible. Everything is possible. And too often, people accept the status quo. Well, we have to do this to feed the world. We have to do this to create enough energy. And we instead have to ask what we are doing, the kind of uh, industry that we're creating, 
okay, it is bringing jobs, maybe bringing uh, wealth to an area, but if it's producing pollution that's making its workers sick and jeopardizing their children, is it worth it? Is there a better way to go? We want a society of people who understand that while we need money to live, we mustn't live for money. And we must help each other and reach out and help those in need and somehow make a more balanced and just world. And we can do it. And it's the young people who help me to understand that we can indeed do it. And never underestimate this amazing human brain. I think the sky may be clear enough tonight that when we leave, we might see the moon. It's almost full. And you all know, because we, we've all heard about it, and I remember the time actually, but we put people on the moon. Astronauts went up and landed on the moon. Okay, that's part of what we understand. But when you next see the moon, whether it's tonight or another night, actually look at it and say to yourself, my goodness, we put a man up on that little moon up there, way, way up there. Wow, it's amazing. When you think of it like that, it's amazing. A woman the other day came up to me after a lecture, and I was outside, it was in California, and I, we had a full moon, I pointed it to her, pointed it out, it was exactly a month ago, and she came up to me afterwards, she said, Jane, I had lost hope, but when you said that and I looked at the moon, I'm full of hope again. We can do it. And my next reason for hope is the resilience of nature if we give it a chance. Look at what's happened with the Million Tree Project. Look at how the desert is driven back. Look at how an area that was hopeless is filled with hope. And you people here in Shanghai had a hand in it. Doesn't that make you feel proud? Aren't you glad that Tori decided that she would take on and develop roots and shoots in Shanghai so that not only the Million Tree Project but all the other amazing things that Roots and Shoots is doing? Doesn't that make you feel, yes, there is hope for the future? You probably know there's hope for the future. Go on hoping and believing because it's true. I wrote a book, the last book I published, it's called Hope for Animals and Their World. And it's a Chinese edition because the book got too long and the publishers in America said, well, we can't have all your examples. So in Chinese, there are examples of Chinese animals, but every example in the book, from China, from Europe, from, from, um, from North America, from Latin America, every book, every story in that book is inspirational. Every single story is about an animal that but for a dedicated biologist or naturalist and a group of people who decided we, the people who overcome seemingly devastating physical disabilities and lead lives that are shining inspirations to us all. And I don't know how many of you watched the Paralympics in London recently on your television screens, but if ever you want proof of the indomitable human spirit overcoming uh, the most terrible, terrible uh, inflictions, then the Paralympics gives you the proof of how amazing we as a species are. And the reason I carry my little friend here, this is Mr. H, given to me by Gary Horn. Gary Horn went blind when he was 21. He was in the US Marines. He decided to become a magician. Everybody said, but Gary, you can't be a good magician if you're blind. And he said, well, I can try. And he's so good that the children for whom he does his shows don't know he's blind. I've seen him. He's amazing. And at the end, he'll tell the children, you know, you tell them he's blind, and then he'll say, things might go wrong in your life, because we never know. But if they do, don't give up. There's always a way forward. Don't give up. And he climbs mountains, he jumps out of airplanes, he dives with great white sharks. He's truly really amazing. And he thought he was giving me a chimpanzee 16 years ago for my birthday. And I said, Gary, I know you can't see it's the wrong color. You know, chimpanzees are black. But I said, you've got no excuse, and I made him hold the tail. 
<laughs> no, chimpanzees don't have to. He said, oh, never mind. Take him where you go, you know my spirit's with you. And so we've been together to 59 countries, and he inspires everybody and helps me to take a message of hope around the world. So I want to end with one last story. And it's a story about a chimpanzee who was born in Africa, whose mother was shot when he was one and a half because the only way to get a baby chimp is to kill or disable the mother. And he was shipped off to a zoo in North America. He was named Jojo. For about 15 years, he lived all alone in isolation in an old-fashioned zoo cage, like the kind that we've been trying to improve in Shanghai through Roots and Shoots. Anyway, he lived all alone, cement floor, pine bars, and nothing to do, boredom. Nobody to learn from. He didn't know about chimpanzee behavior. And then along comes a new zoo director, and he gets 19 other chimpanzees. He wants a nice big gene pool, and he determines to make the best chimpanzee enclosure in North America. And around it, he puts a moat filled with water, because chimpanzees can't swim. Eventually, these uh, chimpanzees, Jojo and the 19 others, they've all been introduced, they've all sorted out their dominance ranks, more or less, and they're let out in the enclosure, and it's fine for a while. And then, one of the younger males challenges the senior male, the senior male is Jojo. And when this young male comes charging towards him, with his hair bristling, his lips bunched in a furious skull, slapping with his hands, stamping with his feet, throwing rocks, Jojo is petrified. He doesn't know anything about this. He hasn't had a chance to learn. And in his fear, he runs into the water. He doesn't know about water either, something you drink in a cup. And he's so scared that he manages to get over the railing that was built to prevent the chimps drowning in the deep water beyond. Three times he comes up gasping for air, and then he disappears. And on the other side of that moat is a small group of people. There's a keeper. Keeper knows Jojo weighs 130 pounds, that male chimpanzees uh, can be very aggressive and dangerous. So he stands and watches. But there's a man there who at that time visited the zoo once a year, just one day, with his wife and little girls. And it happened to be that day, and he jumped into the water, even though the keeper tried to stop him. And he swam feeling under the water until he got hold of Jojo's body. He got this 130-pound dead weight over his shoulder, managed to get over the barrier, and pushed Jojo up onto the bank of the enclosure. And then he turned to rejoin his somewhat hysterical family. There was a woman there with a video camera. She doesn't remember filming. Like everybody else, she was scared. But from this little piece of home video that's all over the place, you can see and hear what happened next. And first of all, the people on the far side begin screaming at Rick to hurry back because they can see three big males approaching with bristling hair to see what's going on and at the same time Jojo is sliding back towards the water because the bank was too steep. And amazingly the video steadies on Rick as he stands there and he's got one hand on that railing and you see him look up at his wife and kids and you see him look up to where these three males are approaching and you see him look down to Jojo, who's just disappearing under the water. And for a moment, he stood there motionless. Then he went back. He went back, and again he pushed Jojo up onto the bank. And this time he stayed there. He ignored the screaming people. He ignored the approaching males. And it's a very dramatic piece of film. He's sliding in the mud, Jojo's making feeble efforts to grab something, and just in time, Jojo gets a thick tuft of grass, and with Rick pushing, manages to pull himself up to safety. And just in time, Rick gets back over that barrier. And that evening, that little piece of film was shown across North America, and the director of the Jane Goodall Institute in the US saw it, and he called up Rick. He said, that was a very brave thing you did. You must have known it was dangerous. Everybody was telling you. What made you do it? And Rick said, well, you see, 
I happened to look into his eyes, and it was like looking into the eyes of a man. And the message was, won't anybody help me? And that's the look that I've seen in the eyes of the chimpanzees whose mothers have been shot in the bushmeat trade. That's why we have sanctuaries for them in Africa. It's the look I've seen in the eyes of chimps in the medical research prisons and those cruelly trained to, to perform in entertainment, which is why we're lobbying to stop those practices. It's the look I've seen in the eyes of elephants chained, rocking from foot to foot, dolphins confined in aquariums, swimming around and around, deprived of the freedom of the seas. In the eyes of dogs thrown out on the street. But I've seen it too in the eyes of the refugees in the big camps in Tanzania who fled goodness knows what horror and violence. And in the eyes of the street children with no homes and in the eyes of the homeless. And when you see that look with your eyes and you feel it in your heart, you have to jump in and try to help. That's what Roots and Shoots is all about. That's why I'm so happy to talk to this group tonight, all of you in one way or another involved in Roots and Shoots and this kind of uh, volunteer work. Because that's my greatest hope. Yes, there are millions of problems around the world. Millions. But I don't know of a single problem where there isn't a person or a group of people working sometimes for little or no money, risking their health, risking their lives, losing their lives to seek for justice, to try to put those problems right. That's the great hope for the future. And that's where Roots and Shoots is playing such an important part because young people, young people like you, are seeing those problems and sitting around and using this amazing gift that we have for language and discussion to talk to each other and say, we're not going to stand for this. Okay, so what do we do? And working out something you can do, rolling up your sleeves, going out there and doing it. So, I want to thank everybody who's helping to make this vision of a new world become more and more of a reality with every passing day. And it is a big vision, but we can do it because I sense as I'm traveling around the world a new, a new kind of spirit. There are more people who are aware. There are more people who are prepared to jump in and try to help. And you're a part of it. So I end with a question. Do you think we can change the world and make it a better place for our great grandchildren? What do you think? Can we? Yes. yes. That doesn't sound very positive. <laughs> can we? Yes. Yay, we can. Thank you. But if you are a student, um, and you would like to ask a question, would ask you to just raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. So, I recently read an article about uh, conservation of nature in Africa that uh, Western countries think about nature conservation differently than the African nations because Africa has been living with nature for such a long time and they think nature is an integrated part of human life, but uh, like Western countries, they think nature and human facilities are separate things. What do you think about this? Um, I think that when um, people are educated to understand, when they have the opportunity to be out in nature, I haven't found any difference in young people in Africa, in North America, in Europe, in Asia. Every single young person I meet who's had the opportunity to understand feels the same. And that's why Roots and Shoots has grown so fast. So there may be a difference in the past, the different kinds of cultures. But you know, all of us, way back then, we all came from cultures, certainly in China, where man and nature lived in harmony. We just got to get back to that same old status of living in harmony with nature. Because if we go on destroying nature, then there's no future for our great-grandchildren. Uh, what, would you, what would you say would be the best way to get into researching animals and helping? What's the best? What would you say would be the best way to get into like, 
like researching animals? The best way to research animals? Well, the, the best way, I mean, you know, you research uh, animals in different ways, but if you want to do it through university and, and do it in a scientific way, you have to get a degree and get a grant and go out there and do it. The most important thing is to really want to do it. It's not easy these days. You can learn about animals without a university degree. You don't have to have a university degree. You can learn about them and become very enriched through the learning. It just depends on what your goal is. Another question? Um, you seem very hopeful. And I was just wondering if there's ever a time where you have lost your hope, and if so, what kept you going? Because you seem very hopeful. You seem very hopeful. Have you ever lost people? Um, I, I have been, uh, there have been times in my life I would be a bit peculiar if I hadn't been really depressed. I think the worst time was, you know, I built up this research station at Gombe, and four of my students were kidnapped in the middle of the night, and we didn't even know what had happened to them. And we had to close down the research station and, and leave. And that was a really, really bad time. Fortunately, all the students were safe. And amazingly, our Tanzanian and field staff, even though for several weeks they weren't paid, they went on and they carried on with their observations. So there was just two days gap in their collection of data, which is when we, we all had to leave. So that was, but I don't know if I lost hope. I was very, very depressed. And I can't remember a time when I actually lost hope. Not really. Thank you. I have a clue for you. Oh, one more? One more. Okay.
awards that are new awards to be granted. And I'll just tell you quickly about these awards. You did not apply for them. So please don't feel like we missed out. This award is established. It's called the Green Star School Award. And what we did was we tried to figure out how can we help schools be more comprehensive about your projects in embracing the environment in a bigger way. Now, of course, we love it if you do one project that's a Roos and Shoots project or your own project. We simply want to recognize that some schools have taken this to a different level. If, it were, uh, if we had more time, I'd tell you how, why these schools were selected. But if your school was selected, you don't know it. If your school was not selected, you don't know it. Please don't think that some are better than others. It's simply setting um, a, a different level of comprehensive embracing of a green initiative. So we have these green star schools. Um, here's, here were the criteria that we used to select them. We said a green star school is one that has, a, has in, encouraged and been part of the Million Tree Project and adopted a forest for more than one year. We said that a green star school has adopted one other project besides Million Tree Project. It didn't have to be a Roots and Juice project, but we needed it to be more than just, not just, but more than the Million Tree Project. We looked for schools that were fostering student leadership because that's at the heart of Roots and Shoots. We looked at schools that are reaching beyond one level. So maybe it started in a high school but reached into a middle school. Maybe it started in a primary school but reached into a kindergarten or preschool. And finally, this one's not so much fun, but many of you do great things, but if you don't tell us about it, we don't know. So we wanted to encourage those who completed reports when we asked for them. So, that's it. And these are the schools which are the first recipients of the Green Star School. So let's give yourself a chance.
American school? Which one? Huda. Come on up. <laughs> I bought 
yeah, yeah, before I knew there was such a thing as Mr. H. So I had my own yeah, yeah, who's visited many of your schools to help us remember that we are bigger, part of a bigger movement. Now some of you know I'm going to be going and moving on and leaving Roots and Shoots, but not really, because I'll still be here as a volunteer. But I would like to introduce the new International School Coordinator, who you already know, and that is Miss Natasha Pay. Thank you very much. 